I'm Pastor Randy Wells, and on behalf of Fairvale Baptist Church, welcome. We're in a wonderful series we've been looking at, full of glory, God's glory, awe and wonder. Today we're looking at good grief. God is good. You know, good grief is not a condition that needs to be treated. Good grief is not a disease that needs to be cured. Good grief is the treatment. Good grief is the cure. In Isaiah 53, we'll see the truth of that. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one who men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Good grief. God is good. And good grief in us is godly sorrow. We're going to look at the fact that godly sorrow is a U-turn back to God for forgiveness and transformation. By way of introduction, can we all say the best will always be enough for us. Who has it better than we do? Nobody. God is with us. God is for us. God is in us. And God desires to work through us. Oh, that's life to the full. That's love, joy, peace, and power. How could it bear? How could it, this be, really? Well, there's a song that goes like this. At Calvary. Oh, if you know that song, you need to look that up. How about we surveyed the wondrous cross that we, we uh, so know. Yeah, what a great tune that is. And then the glory of God's grace is greater than our sin. These are worship songs, friends. God gave us his very best, his own divine son, and the best will always be enough for us. And what is our role? Well, to love him as our first love and to follow Christ as our intimate master in fellowship. And that fellowship is a personal interactive relationship an intimate one whereby we learn of Christ and his will and his word and in our relationship with him, this wonderful communion with him, interaction with him, we become like him. But will we instead turn from him and deceive ourselves? Point number one, walking in darkness, saying you're in fellowship with God. You know, some hate the light, as Jesus said, and won't come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Sometimes we as Christians hate the light and won't come to repentance. In 1 John verse 5 and 6, 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 and 6, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that 
we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But oh, even when we grieve God, he works all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his, his own will. And that, what is that will? To be conformed into the image of his son. That's you and me. That he would be, Christ Jesus, the first born among many brethren. Listen to, to excuse me, C.S. Lewis. He had it right when he wrote, God is not proud. He will have us even though we have shown that we prefer everything else to him. Oh, that's a, a, a terrible thing, but true that we would have anything else but him sometimes. I mean, that's the flesh speaking there. And you know, we see that in the church of Corinth. They're walking in darkness. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1, Paul writes, It's actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. So the Apostle Paul has to deal with a case in Corinth of incest. And he lays down a list of sins for which church members should be held under discipline. Oh, spurious claims of fellowship with God have been tragically numerous down through the, the ages of, of church history. And as the apostle John warned, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we do not follow the truth. Here's the point. There can be only one sphere of real communion with God, the light itself. First John and now chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And if we say we have no sin... We're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. God shines spiritually like the sun he created, bringing light and heat and life. All sin is walking in darkness. And yet we can come into the light and find forgiveness, healing, and transformation. Verse 9 we saw last week, tells us about that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we saw last time, that is the cleansing of the heart, the purification of the heart. Now let's get back to the church of California. O oops, the church of Corinth. Oh, you know, there's quite a connection of, of commonness there between those two churches. Point number two, godly sorrow is a U-turn as we come back to God for forgiveness and transformation. First, good grief in 2 Corinthians is called godly sorrow in dealing with our sin. And godly sorrow brings about this forgiveness and transformation. Good grief is godly sorrow. Well, the father's grief over the young prodigal's return and his older son's pride represents the grief of God. Ephesians 4.30 tells us, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. There's no way we can share the holiness of our Heavenly Father without, and plus grow in Christ's likeness without having godly sorrow for our own sins. Connecting with God's grief through His Spirit for our sin and then actually grieve for the sins of the world. Well, 
in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians and in verse 4, Paul describes his grief. Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. Now, the object of this letter was to bring godly sorrow and repentance among the Corinthians who were in the dark, walking in the dark. I mean, their eyes were shut to incest and acting as if they're very spiritual for their tolerance. This kind of gross immorality was something that was even shocking to the heathen. But lo and behold, Paul's confronting the fellowship in Corinth worked through the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And they brought discipline to this offending brother. And he repented. But now they were reluctant to restore him to fellowship. Can you believe it? So Paul has to write and say to them in chapter 2, verse 6 of 2 Corinthians, Sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. Well, Paul, in the power of the Spirit and the Word, by the grace of God, which means God at work, brought about repentance, friends, of the fellowship's arrogance and, of course, the, the, their sin of, intoler of tolerance, rather, and uh, really just letting go of this egregious sin. They repented of that, and, and uh, so did this offending brother. He was cut in his, his thinking and in his heart, and he knew he needed to repent and come back to God and confess sins and be cleansed. So Paul is uh, an example of how uh, some, God can work through us. And we experience in our own lives or we can be a vessel of, of grace to others uh, in demonstrating the godly sorrow, this good grief. God is so good. So now let's go a little deeper because they have repented as a church. And so they repented of their arrogance. They repented of, of being really uh, ignorant of, of going to them, to this man, and bringing him out of the church and church discipline and talking with them and sharing with them that this can't be a part because sin can be like leaven. It can permeate the whole loaf. And so uh, he listened. He came back. But he, they wouldn't. They wouldn't let him back. And so Paul writes to him again, as we saw, and they said, okay, and they're, they're turning back to God again on another misstep, and they receive him and forgive him and tell them uh, of, of their love for him. So let's look at this transforming of this church and this wonderful example that godly sorrow can not only take away our sin but transform our lives when we confess our sins. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 11. For though I caused you sorrow in my letter, Paul writes, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. Now here are key verses, 10 and 11. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation or deliverance from that sin. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Verse 11. For behold, what earnestness, this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. 
what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in this matter. Well, let's take a closer look. This godly sorrow leads to a repentance that's of no regret. Well, certainly we always regret sinning against the Lord, but we have no regret that we repented because not only did we turn from it and bring it to God and, and find forgiveness, but he also shows us, and we, we learn from our mistakes, that God's will is right and good, and his spirit can give us the power to do God's will, his word and his spirit. But this worldly sorrow, oh, that leads to death. And this worldly sorrow can be very bitter and intense like Esau. You remember when he was grieved with many tears over the loss of his birthright, but found no place of repentance. And then in his anger sought to kill his brother Jacob for deceiving him. Worldly sorrow, friends, is like all sin. It misses the mark. How? By leaving God out, just as all sin does. It's sorrow for oneself, centered on self, not sorrow of sin against God. But you know, this can bring death because it can bring toxic shame into our lives. Guilt says, I've sinned. I've done something wrong, something bad. But shame, toxic shame says, I am wrong, I am bad, and I am helpless and hopeless to change. That's this worldly sorrow. And you know, here's an example. Judas, when he had betrayed Jesus, Jesus went out and hung himself. Oh, that was godly sorrow doing its worst. But contrast that with Peter who went out and wept bitterly after denying Jesus three times. And that led to forgiveness and restoration that would come not long from then. Godly sorrow, good grief, is grief that acknowledges your actions are grievous to God. Don't ever be fooled by tears that come from self-pity and anger. You know, what is so wonderful is that the restoration and the transformation that God sorrow, godly sorrow brought in this church of Corinth. You know, their repentance was verified in eight ways. And there are eight points of transformation. Let's look at these eight real quick. He says, for what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. Now, what is earnestness? Well, earnestness rejects indifference. Oh, yeah. And it is intentionally serious about the way one lives. Number two, what vindication of yourselves, proving the sin was merely a flesh wound. God had granted repentance. And that's God's vindication. Then number three, what indignation. That's God's righteous anger. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. Number four, fear. That's godly reverence as they had sinned against their holy God. Well, number five, in the church of Corinth, in their repentance, brought about the fruit of longing. What a transformation. A longing to make things right with God and Paul. And finally, with the offending brother. What zeal. That's fervent love for God and his will. What a vain, avenging of wrong. Number seven, they demonstrated their willingness to see the offender disciplined and now restored. And then number eight. And finally, having described a, a sevenfold repentance of transformation, he gives us one more. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the bad matter, number eight. 
You know, godly sorrow works in us a cleansing and a justification. It's just as if we never sinned. He cleanses us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.8, as we saw earlier. Good grief, God is good. Look at what happened to the church of Corinth. They, they came to God for cleansing and forgiveness, and they had restoration and transformation. You know, like the prodigal's father, as his son returns, oh, Paul would have been like the father. He would want to have celebrated. And if he had a fatted calf, it would be prime rib for everyone. This is what happened when they took a U-turn back to God. And for us, this is what we can experience. We turn away from our sin of the flesh or the world system, and we come and return to God in confession and repentance. We have one last point, and this is, what do we do after we've repented of something and been forgiven? And this is about Christ in you, our hope of glory, because it's incarnational reality. So after receiving forgiveness and transformation, what are these Californians, oh, I mean, Corinthians to do? Well, what are we to do after we make a U-turn and come back to God and confess our sins and forgive Him? Well, this is what we do. In what we've been confessing and turning from, we practice putting Christ on. Putting on Christ, Romans 13, 14. Christ in you, in me, is our hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27. Because he is our incarnational reality. You remember when Paul said in Galatians 2, 20, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Now in 1 John 4, verse 4, the Apostle John says, He that is within you is greater than he that is within the world. That's incarnational reality. You know, there is a wonderful song I used to know called Mirrors. And uh, it's interesting my, my daughter and my son are in a band, and they're songwriters, and, and they produce great music. They've got several albums now coming, and they've got one out now already. And they, they're called Mirrors, an interesting thing. So, so this gal, way back in the latter part of the 70s and the early 80s, her name is uh, Evie Turnquist. And she, she was just a cute gal, and she would share these wonderful spiritual Christian contemporary music songs. And this was called Mirrors, and it goes like this, this one line, so good. She says, you can find Jesus in the Bible. You can find Jesus in many churches that I know. But until you find Jesus in the mirror, you've got a long ways to go. See, that's incarnational reality. Christ in us, our hope of glory. This is so important. So how do we know he's in us? How do we see him in us? Well, this is how. 1 Corinthians 1.30. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification, and redemption. These last three terms exemplify the first, wisdom. Wisdom in the person of Christ, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found. That's in second uh, chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 3. His wisdom manifests itself as righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Righteousness, it's important to know, has to do with our standing before God. It's more than doing right, it's being right. By faith we have Christ's righteousness 
imputed to us. In other words, put to our account, but also Christ's righteousness is imparted to us. It's part of our life. It's part of our truest being and identity. But also, we're sanctified. What does that mean? Well, we're set apart to God, to belong to Him, and to serve Him. Redemption, the third quality, emphasizes the fact that we are set free because Christ paid for our sins. Redemption emphasizes the fact that we are set free because Jesus paid the price for us on the cross. And this will be complete redemption when he returns. But listen to this. Christ has made all this to us. He has made all this to us and lives in us, with us, and through us. And what an awesome thing. We all learn to practice his presence, which is our righteousness. I want to say that again. We learn to practice his presence. He's omnipresent. He's, he says, I will always be with you. I am with you till the, always, to even the end of the age. And so we practice his presence. He's here with us. And that presence is our righteousness. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We're putting on Christ, who is our righteousness. And that breastplate protects us and encourages us and gives us a heart for doing the right thing in God's eyes and, and doing the good, which love is based on doing good to others, loving others and doing them good. Well, Martin Luther, that great reform, reformer, boy, what an example he is to us. See, until he understood incarnational reality, Christ's righteousness in us, he couldn't receive forgiveness. He was a very religious monk, but oh, he, he couldn't receive it because he just saw himself as this worthless sinner. And he certainly could not accept that about himself. And now we, we may not be crawling, knee, bare kneed, you know, on uh, sharp stones as, as he would, and walking up very rocky steps on his knees, wearing hair shirts. How uncomfortable could that be? or self-flagellating ourselves with whips. But you know, many Christians are doing spiritual and emotional equivalents in their lives. See, Luther was in this terrible place until he came to understand that the righteousness of God in Christ that Paul spoke of, rather than being wrathful and legalistic, it was, in fact, something that we put on. See, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. We put on Christ, who is our righteousness. But you know, uh, even more importantly, it is something that is in us. It's God's life in us. When Martin Luther finally understood this, he cried out, Faith has the incomparable grace of uniting the soul to Christ, as bride, as a bride to husband, so that the soul possesses whatever Christ himself possesses. What a great truth he found. He was at that time freed from this incredible fear that he couldn't please God. He couldn't keep Christ's word. He couldn't follow God and discerning God's will and performing it. If Luther could see only his, his unrighteousness, the bad guy of the fallen flesh within before his healing, how many members of Christ's body, how many Christians there are who deny the false self altogether, the false self of the flesh. Even when Romans 8, 6 is so clear, the mind set on the flesh that old Adamic nature that wants to be first and, and doesn't know God. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. You see, without acknowledging this bad guy within, they're actually practicing his presence. 
So they go through life and they feel guilt and shame and then more guilt and more shame and they live and go about unforgiven. Now, on the other side, there are many people who, rather than feeling guilty, become prideful Boy, and they cause a lot of misery. You may know some. I mean, we call that the Pharisee of the flesh. Within them, their heart becomes harder and harder and they practice the presence of this imposter. They become legalistic and judgmental to others when and while never really seeing their own darkness. Now, apart from the need of seeing incarnational reality, which is Christ's righteousness in us, there's this commonality with all fallen people, but also with Christians fallen flesh my flesh, your flesh. And that's that terrible passion to be perfect on our own. And so is there any wonder that the key to healing is confession and repentance? We have to come to the truth, friends, of Psalm 142, verse 12. No one living is righteous before you. We must be discipled. We must become an apprentice of Christ. We must be disciplined into this incarnational reality. And as we learn to acknowledge Christ, his righteousness, as part of our spiritual identity, we experience a freedom from striving to be good enough and, and from the wrong kind of fear of God. We learn the truth that we don't have to and don't want to practice the presence of the fallen flesh. We take off the old self of sin, the imposter of the flesh, and put on Christ, put on the shield, the breastplate rather, of righteousness. So let's sum up. We uh, don't stand in any righteousness of our own, friends, not any righteousness that we've earned but in his. And the fact always keeps us, that fact that it's in his righteousness, not our own, that we stand, that keeps us practicing his presence, which is our righteousness. Satan, our accuser, always was trying to get us to look to our own righteousness, and he is the accuser of our souls. But we, as Revelation 12, 11 tells us, we have the blood of the Lamb, so what caused that? Christ being put to death for our sins. And we have then, as that text tells us, the word of our testimony, and we testify, that's where the old man of sin, that's where our false self, that's where the, the, uh, the self of sin died on that cross. The blood of Christ is what brings us into new life, a new birth, as a new creation in Christ. And we have his imparted righteousness as our own. So that's how we overcome the accuser of our souls. We put on the breastplate of righteousness, which is Christ's presence. And we live out of the reality. And here it is, friends, that he is our life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And he's our righteousness. So when we sin, we go to God and say, you're our righteousness. This was sin against who you are in my life. And I ask you to forgive the action of that fleshly part of me, that hardwired Adamic nature that is an imposter. It's my false self. I turn that over. I, I take that off and I receive your forgiveness. Here's the point. We reign in life by the abundance of grace and by the gift of righteousness. Oh, friends, that is the best life. We are to reign. How? By the abundance of grace. What's grace? God working in us and through us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This abundance of God working his grace in my life and the gift of righteousness in your life. Ah. Oh. Tremendous. This is, friends, the best life. What did we look at earlier as we started? 
the best will always be enough for us. Who? Us, who have Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He lives in us. And the wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption he brings to us. You know, here's how the wonderful hymn goes. At Calvary, that was where the best came from. By God's word, at last my sin I learned. And I trembled at the law and that I spurned till my guilt, guilty soul implore, imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon, liberty, and, Cal and Calvary was where I found grace multiplied to me. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? Father, we praise you and we worship you. You delight in forgiving us and in the godly sorrow that you have, that we can sense your spirit's grief and this godly sorrow that we've sinned against you. And, and when we, we are, are drawn into repentance by this good grief, you forgive us and cleanse us. You didn't spare your very best, your son, for you knew that having him, we would have you and the Holy Spirit. We have the best. You knew the best will always be enough for us. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.